All right, take your Bibles and open them to the book of Revelation, chapter number 3. So, pinag-aaralan natin ang pastors and churches, um, really of the of the New Testament that we've seen, okay? We're going through uh, a, a pretty long study on the New Testament church, and we looked at what is church, We looked at uh, uh, what are the qualities of church, the four major qualities of church. And uh, we looked at um, the missionary journeys of Paul and the churches that Paul planted and made some notes about their uh, uh, information that we have in Scripture. And as we studied the mission, uh, mission works, church planting works of Paul, we looked at the church planting Uh, ministry of Peter also and also we saw that uh, uh, now we're looking at the last seven churches uh, in the book of Revelation and uh, this book of Revelation is written to the pastors right and uh, also there's a message for the churches and we looked at uh, the church at Ephesus Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, and last week, uh, Sardis. And uh, tonight we're going to see uh, chapter 3, verse number 7 uh, to 13, the church at Philadelphia, and then uh, next week, uh, the, the church in Laodicea. And that will complete the churches, uh, pastors and churches of the book of Revelation. And so there's seven churches here. Okay? And, uh, and I'd like to go back and look at more churches uh, that we haven't really covered. We, we did a general survey. We had an idea of some of the churches around here, but uh, we need to look closer to some other churches, and then we'll conclude the 20-part series <laughs> on the New Testament church. Okay? All right, so <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3 And verse number seven. Let's see here. The Bible says, and, the, uh, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. And again, who are, who's the angel? Pastor. The pastor. Okay. The word angel means messenger. Okay. Uh, at huwag kalimutan kung meron kayong question o habang nag-aaral tayo, uh, ilagay nyo na lang sa comments and we'll be able to try to answer your questions as we study the scriptures, okay? So this is the pastor of the church in Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia uh, means brotherly love, brotherly love. And, uh, and that's a very appropriate name because the founder of this city of Philadelphia, um, his name is uh, Attalus II Philadelphus, and uh, he definitely loved his brother, and his brother is, uh, let's see here, I got my notes here, his brother is Eumenes II, and so Eumenes and uh, um, Atlas, Atlas, a uh, very close relationship as brothers, and of course, if you have a brother, you're blessed of the Lord. And you shouldn't be fighting. You should, uh, you know, if you have a sister or a, a brother and sister, a, a family should not be fighting family. They should be a loving family. Uh, and by the way, uh, what did Jesus say? Is the number one mark, hereby ye know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. And so love is the badge of true discipleship and uh, the church ought to be a house of brotherly love the church is, ought to be a house of brotherly love and uh, so I hope you see that in our churches <clears throat> all right now uh, the key words in here relate to the geography and history of the city of Philadelphia So the Bible goes on to say, These things saith he 
that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. So there's four descriptions of Jesus Christ. We find him as the one who is holy. That means he's without sin. And also that he's separated for the mission, for the purpose of God. What was Jesus' mission when he came to earth the first time? He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And now what's Jesus' mission the second coming? When he comes back, what do you think his mission is? Judge. To judge, that's right and to establish the millennial kingdom. So he came the first time as a lamb, ready to be slain. A lamb, uh, uh, lamb of God um, that will take away the sin of the world. But when he comes back, he won't come back as a, uh, as a meek lamb. He's going to come back as a lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's going to rip up all his enemies. So he is holy. He is true. Remember what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So he is holy. He is true. Everything that Jesus says, every word that Jesus mentioned, you can trust in his word. He's true. He, doesn't, he never lies. <clears throat> he that hath the key of David. What's this key of David? Now, uh, again... The, the, the Bible assumes that we know the Old Testament. All right, so who is David in the Old Testament? The king of Israel. And if, he, if Jesus has the key of David, what is that telling us? When Jesus comes back, he's going to rule and reign in Jerusalem, where David ruled and reigned. <laughs> and uh, he has the authority, the power, uh, of that. Go over to Isaiah chapter 22 and you see how the old, uh, the, the, the book of Revelation always takes us back to the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22. Look at verse number 22. Isaiah chapter 22, verse number 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. You know, you remember the, the ark uh, of uh, Noah, when God told Noah to build an ark? You know, God opened the door of the ark, and he told them to come in. And when Noah and his wife and his son and sons and his daughter-in-law came in, after all the animals came in, God shut the door of the ark. Now, how many of Noah's family was able to get out? None. How many of the people in the world, the worldlings, the earth dwellers, the ones who rejected the good news, uh, the ones who rejected the message of repentance, how many of those people were able to get in? None. Because God is the one who opens doors and shuts doors, and it doesn't matter who you are, if God opens a door and you don't enter into that door, and He shuts it, you're not coming in. And so this is a very important scripture passage here. Uh, the... the uh, Jesus holds the key of David. And of course, this is a prophecy of the future reign and authority of Jesus Christ. Uh, when you study the Bible, there are many keys in the Bible. So you got the key of David. Uh, there's the key of death and hell. Go over to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I want to give you some key theology. <laughs> the theology of keys. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1, here's another key, verse 18, Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. We saw the key of David, now you'll see this one here, 118, I am he that liveth and was dead, 
and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. So who holds the keys of hell and death? Jesus Christ does, you see. He has the key of David. He has the key of hell and death. Uh, what does that mean? That means he has power and authority to take life and to judge them and to cast them into hell. You see, that's Jesus's authority and prerogative. He holds the keys, you see. <clears throat> There's also uh, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 18? Let's go to Matthew 18. <clears throat> Let's look at that key. I told you there are some Bible keys. You should know some Bible keys, biblical keys. Matthew chapter 18 Okay. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I think it's Matthew 16. Yeah, sorry, Matthew 16. Verse 19, Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So the church is given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so... The church has the great opportunity to open the keys of heaven to a community when they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You remember when Peter preached at Pentecost and the keys of heaven, he was that, he used that key of heaven, he preached the gospel, and 3,000 people got saved, and 3,000 people got baptized and added to the church. Now, uh, that opens that Jewish community to the gospel. Now, you remember, it was also Peter that preached to Cornelius' house, the Gentiles. And uh, Cornelius' household and Cornelius got saved, the Gentiles got saved. Uh, Peter used the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, uh, that's a, an amazing work uh, of church planting. And uh, what about this, uh, whosoever thou shalt bind on earth? That's church membership. That's church membership. So when you get saved, God wants you to get baptized and added to the church. You're bound to that church membership. And then, of course, if we have to get rid of members because of insubordination to the authority of Jesus Christ, you kick them out of the church. That's church discipline. You loose them, you see. And heaven acknowledges that. It says, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Heaven, God already sanctions whatever uh, uh, the church has to do in order to promote the kingdom of heaven on earth, you see. And that has to do with uh, all that responsibility. So we see the key of David, you got the keys of hell and death. There's the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Those are Bible keys that you should be aware of. Let's go back to Revelation chapter number 7. I'm sorry, chapter 3 and verse number 7. <clears throat> he, uh, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. By the way... Uh, you know that Paul and Timothy and Silas uh, traveled through and wanted to preach the gospel in Asia, but God said no, and they wanted to preach in Bithynia, and God said no, and they wanted to go to um, Mycenae, and God said no, so they ended up in Troas. And in Troas, they end, uh, he got the call to come to Macedonia, and so... God opens doors and shuts doors, you see. <clears throat> now, why did God shut the door to Asia? Because Peter was there. And Peter was the one 
who uh, started uh, ministering to the scattered Jewish churches from Jerusalem that were scattered all over Asia. And so God has a plan and a purpose. If God opens a door of opportunity for you to be involved in ministry, man, take advantage of God's open door. And uh, if God shuts the door, don't be discouraged. Find out God's will and, and God will open doors for you. And no man is able to shut it, the Bible says. Do you think the pandemic can shut the church down? I don't think so. I don't believe so. Uh, the devil can try all he can, as hard as he can, to try to shut down God's plan for this day and age. But we have a great door uh, of opportunity that's open for service. And no man can shut it, according to the Bible. Look at verse number 8. Again, Jesus is speaking to the pastor of the church in Philadelphia. I know thy works. This is the pastor's works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. So there's an open door of church work that God is interested in for the pastor and the church in Philadelphia. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Now, we looked at the keys, right? There are three Bible keys that you should know. Here are some doors in the Bible. Now there are some doors. I'll give you some door theology here. Now we see there in verse number 8, the open door of church work, okay, or service. Church work or service. Uh, God intends to use uh, the Baptist assembly or the Baptist church or the local New Testament organized visible assembly of baptized disciples to carry out the work of the Lord. Who is supposed to evangelize today? Can anybody just do the work of evangelism? Yeah. No, that's assigned to the church. Who can disciple today? It's the church, you see. Who can baptize today? It's still the church, you see. Who can do Lord's Supper today? Church. It's the church. So everything is given to the church. That's the great open door that is before Philadelphia. Now, <clears throat> here's another door. Uh, there's uh, the door of the heart. There's the door of the heart. Look at Revelation chapter 3. You're in chapter 3. Look at verse number 20. Verse number 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. That's true fellowship. That's true unity with Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the door of your heart, the door of your life. And Jesus Christ is knocking. If any man hear, do you hear the Savior knocking? Then you need to t open your door's heart and take him as your Lord and Savior and have fellowship with him. And uh, sweet communion with the Lord, the door of the heart. Then there's the door, uh, uh, the door uh, of the rapture. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 1. This is the door of the rapture. It's a picture of the rapture. After this I looked, chapter 4, verse 1, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Oh, there's a door that is opened in heaven. And uh, I heard, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee these things which must be hereafter. And so, come up hither. Oh, that's the door in heaven that opens up. Uh, what a picture of the rapture of the believers. Then there's the door of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Go over to Revelation 19. See, we're learning about Bible keys. Now we're learning about Bible doors. <laughs> Revelation chapter 19, verse number 11. Revelation 19, verse 11. 
And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. I saw heaven opened. <laughs> and there goes that door in heaven opening, and Jesus Christ coming back uh, as a mighty king, as the Lord of lords, as a warrior, the word of God, read the two-edged sword, ready to slay his enemies. Oh, that's a powerful door, the second coming, the door of the second coming. So the Bible's full of doors. Of course, Jesus said, I am the door. That's another thing that Jesus said, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyway, uh, we have uh, Bible keys and Bible doors. Let's go back to Revelation chapter number 3, verse number 9. Revelation, well, Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So the church at Philadelphia was a small church. This little strength is not talking about weak church. It's talking about the size of their church. So it's not a big, massive church like the church in Ephesus. Uh, this is a small church, a little strength. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Jesus loves his churches. And it doesn't matter what the size of the church is to Jesus. That's not a big deal. Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 32. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. <clears throat> Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So Jesus had a little flock, and so he's used to this little flock. And so the church at Philadelphia had little strength. They were a small church, but they were a strong church. You see, you don't have to have a big church to impress the Lord, but you better have a strong church. A faithful few is better than a, a hundred spew. <laughs> when you look at the church at Laodicea, uh, Jesus will spew them out of his mouth. But when you look at the church of Philadelphia, he's going to receive them. He's going to take them uh, and, and uh, fellowship with them. See, uh, again, let me stress... Uh, it's good to have a big church if the big church is faithful to the Lord. It's good to have a small church if, if the church is faithful to the Lord. So the size is not the important thing. The important thing is faithfulness to the Lord. Okay? And that's uh, the testimony of Scripture here. Uh, remember, little is much when God is in it. And uh, so they were commended for two things. What were they commended for? For thou hast little strength and hast kept my word. They were faithful to the written word of God. They, the word of his patience. Uh, they kept his word. They protected his word. They guarded his word. Now let me remind you, what did God use in the New Testament to preserve his words? He used the New Testament church. Now, what did he use in the Old Testament to preserve the Old Testament? Israel, Israel the nation of Israel. And in the New Testament, he uses the churches. So the churches received the word of God. They copied the word of God and they circulated the word of God. And of course, John and Peter and Paul were compiling the word of God. And uh, <clears throat> they were commended for keeping the word of God. So let me ask you a question. Does your church keep the word of God? Does it matter to the Lord if you have all of his words? Yes, it's very important to God. That's why we use the King James Bible. Why? Because modern translations change the words of God. They take away some verses. They don't just take away one or two verses. In some cases, they like Mark chapter 16. 
They've taken 12 verses out. In John chapter 7 and John chapter 8, they've taken another 12 verses out. You see? Uh, not, and then they change words and just contradict the, the words of God. And uh, they don't have the words. You ask any of the Bible critics, any of the Bible scholars that the academics look up to, and you ask them, do you have the words of God? And they'll tell you, we are not sure. And we're working towards that. And they've been on the 28th edition of the critical text. Pretty soon the 29th edition is coming out. I wonder what changes they'll make then. There'll be other changes. They don't look at it as changes. They look at it as, a, they look at it as options. Well, it's just a different reading. It's just a different, you know, uh, reading. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> and uh, we'll look at that sometime in the future. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, so the church at Philadelphia kept the word of God. And so I hope that you're involved in a church that's keeping the word of God. God's going to commend us for that. Uh, the written word is very important to him. And not only has they kept his word, in verse number 8 it says, And has not denied my name. They didn't deny the incarnate word. What's the name of Jesus Christ in John chapter 1 verse 1? And the word was with God, and the word was God. So Jesus, one of his names is Word. So he is the word made flesh, the incarnate word. And Philadelphia was faithful to the written word and faithful to the incarnate word, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus commended the church at Philadelphia. He had nothing bad to say about this church. All right, the other church was Smyrna. Of the seven churches, the only two churches that did not receive co condemnation or or rebuke from the Lord is uh, Smyrna and Philadelphia. And why was Philadelphia commended? Because they were faithful to the written word of God and they were faithful to the incarnate word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, you see. And how you treat the word is how you treat Jesus Christ. Think about it. Uh, if you neglect the word of God, you're neglecting Jesus. If you don't take time to study the Word of God, you're not interested in Jesus, you see. If, uh, if you try to correct the written Word, it's like you're correcting Jesus Christ, you see, uh, because they're both the Word of God. And what's true of this Word is true of the incarnate Word. This is the written Word, he is the incarnate word. And if he cannot be defeated, this word will never be defeated. You see, if he is true and holy and faithful, the word of God is true and holy and faithful. You see, all right, well, <clears throat> they didn't deny him. Now, look at verse number nine. There's the enemy of the church in Philadelphia, which is also the enemy in these churches. Verse number 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Certainly, uh, these are Jewish false believers, Jewish false brethren, or, or apostates. They, were, they wanted to be church members. Uh, and perhaps they were church members. They faked their profession. And uh, they're not true to their word. But Jesus knows them. See, it's hard for us to tell today who's saved and who's not saved. You know, you look at Lot, for example, in the Bible. You, you remember how Lot was a... If it wasn't for uh, Second Peter calling him a righteous man who vexed his soul, <laughs> we'd have thought that Lot was a big-time sinner and not saved with, the, with the, the terrible testimony he had. But... The Bible calls him a righteous man. And so it's hard for us to discern who's saved and who's not saved. 
But I'll tell you one thing, Jesus Christ, who's holy and true, Jesus Christ knows. He could tell. He could look into a person's heart. He knows who is saved and who's of the synagogue of Satan, you see. It's not a trouble for the Lord. He knows it. Which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. And this is the day and age we live in. We live in a day and age of liars. Oh, yes, I'll come to church. Yes, I'm interested in the Lord. But when you look at their life, liar, you see. Oh, my. <clears throat> Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Oh, God loves the pastor. God loves the church. And he's going to make sure that the enemies of the church will bow down to the Lord Jesus Christ. And right next to the Lord Jesus Christ will be all the people who are saved and born again. And uh, they're going to rule and reign right next to Jesus Christ. That's a, a mighty thing. But that's the work of the Lord. Uh, remember what Paul said, Every knee shall bow, and con every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hey, let me tell you something. God the Father himself is going to make sure that every knee will bow to the glory of uh, God. Uh, and call Jesus Lord. <clears throat> and uh, we, as his, uh, as believers, as his children, we're going to rule and reign as kings and priests right next to him. And so they will bow down, not just to the Lord, but to us, according to this passage of Scripture here. <clears throat> so amazing stuff going on in the future. <clears throat> Verse number 10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. And what is this hour of temptation that the church will be kept from? And I want you to notice that. They're going to be kept. That means they're going to be protected from. They're going to be... Um, they're going to be... Uh, excluded from, taken away from <clears throat> this time of judgment. He says here, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Jesus is, has promised his assembly, the pastor and the assembly here, that they will be kept from or excluded, or taken out of, so that they can avoid this hour of temptation. Now, <clears throat> what is this hour of temptation? Well, it's the. Uh, it's also called the hour of judgment. Look at Revelation chapter fourteen. Hang on. Revelation chapter fourteen. Revelation chapter fourteen, and verse number seven. Revelation 14, verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give, him, uh, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. So what's this hour uh, that He's talking about? It's the tribulation period, you see. The seven-year tribulation period. That's what I thought. You had your hand up. It was, I'm, I'm thinking it's the tribulation period. Correct. It's the hour uh, uh, of temptation, the hour of judgment. Go over to Jerem uh, Daniel. Go over to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12 <clears throat> goes all the way back to the Old Testament again. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, 
And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So uh, that time of trouble, that hour of judgment. Uh, look over in um, Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. And verse number 7. Jeremiah chapter 30. Verse number 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. So this is for Jacob's tribes, for Jacob's sons, the, the Israelites. So is the church kept from the hour? Yes, they are. Why? Because this is to try the people that are dwelling on the earth, the earth dwellers, the earthlings, those that are of the world. It is also to try Israel, but it doesn't touch the church. It doesn't ch touch the assemblies of the Lord. And more than just the assemblies, it doesn't touch any of the believers. Anybody who's born again, they are kept from the hour. Uh, look over, for example, in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. You see, uh, they were faithful to keep his word. He'll be faithful to keep them from this hour of tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 5. <clears throat> Yeah. He kept from wrath. I got the wrong passage here. Oh no. First Thessalonians five nine. First Thessalonians five nine. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. That's the tribulation but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's deliverance. So <clears throat> let me ask you a question. Did God pour judgment on the earth before Noah was safe in the ark or after he was safe in the ark? After he was safe. After he was taken out of the way. Oh, did God pour judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah while Lot was in it? Yeah. He was removed, wasn't he? He was taken out. And that's a pattern, you see. God's not going to pour his wrath on this earth until the believers are taken out. You see, are caught up, are snatched up at the rapture of the believer. And so that's a promise from God. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 3 as we conclude. <clears throat> Verse number 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So can a church, can Christians lose rewards? Yes, they can. <laughs> if you're not faithful to the Lord, you can lose the rewards. And we talked about the five crowns already. Uh, as we study the scriptures here. Uh, look at verse number 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God. He's going to be a pillar in the temple of God, uh, meaning to say he will be a permanent, fixed Christian in the new Jerusalem. You know, churches change. It's a sad thing today. Churches change. It used to be a church is strong and biblical, and they sing the hymns and the old songs and the psalms and the spiritual songs. But churches change. And it's so sad when old-time members in the church are no longer welcome in the church. It's sad when maybe a pastor that pastored a church for numbers of years, no longer welcome in the church he pastored. But Jesus said, don't worry, Christian. I'm going to make you a permanent 
pillar and no man's going to be able to move you anymore. And uh, boy, what a great church we're going to have in heaven. You see, it's a promise from the Lord. <clears throat> uh, a pillar in the temple of my God and uh, he shall go no more out and I will write upon him three things. Uh, the pillar will bear the name of God, the name of the city of God, and the new name of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is going to be given a new name, you see. We don't know what that name is. The Bible doesn't tell us, but I'm sure it's going to be one of the most beautiful names that will capture all the attributes of Jesus Christ in one name. And that we're going to bear that name. What a promise from the Lord. <clears throat> Um, by the way, do you know the name of the city of God? New the New Jerusalem. There's another name. Look at Ezekiel. It's amazing how it goes back to the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 48. Ezekiel chapter 48. What's the name of this temple of the Lord? Uh, Ezekiel chapter 48 verse 35. Ezekiel 48, verse 35. It was round about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. The Lord is there. Oh, you know, I believe wherever the Lord is, that's where heaven is. That's where heaven is. <laughs> and uh, the Bible says, the Lord is Capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah is there. Oh, man, that's, that's going to be a great place uh, to be there. <clears throat> so the believer and uh, the church member is likened to a pillar. Uh, stability and uh, uh, will be established by the Lord. And, uh, you know, Philadelphia was known for having buildings that had earthquakes. And the, the pillars cracked and crumbled they had a volcano, <laughs> and the volcano would erupt and destroy the buildings, you see. But let me tell you something. When we get to heaven, when we're in the presence of the Lord, when we're in glory with the Lord Jesus Christ, there'll be nothing that will be able to change the fact that we will forever be with the Lord. All right, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's see. As we conclude here, Revelation chapter 3, verse 13. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Is the Holy Spirit still speaking to the churches? Yes, He is. He's speaking to His assemblies today. And so we as Christians can take great comfort in knowing that, hey, things may change here on earth, but there's coming a time when God's going to rule and reign and it's not going to shift and change. And we have a permanent house in the temple of the Lord. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless them. Father in heaven, we thank you for the great truths that we find in Scripture concerning uh, the church in Philadelphia. And what's true for that assembly is true for every assembly. And uh, we look forward to your great promise that you are going to keep us from the hour that will try this world. And uh, we look for that blessed hope, that glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that uh, we would get great encouragement that although, although many things in this earth shift and change, uh, your word never changes, and we have it, and your promise never changes, and we look forward to being with you in glory where we will always be with you and glorify you forever. We love you, Lord, and ask your blessing upon us now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.